Welcome to Independence, the FIEC podcast. My name's Phil Topham, Executive Director of the FIEC. Uh, and joining me today for our regular dive into the news are our National Director, John Stevens. Good morning, John. Hi, Phil. Uh, and our Head of National Ministries, Adrian Reynolds. Hello, Adrian. Thank you for restoring me to the starting Well, we have. Up. You were benched for a couple of times, weren't you? I feel you're and, a bit uh, like Gareth Southgate. You don't really know what your strongest 11 is. <laughs> no, well, so, but, but maybe, you're my, you. maybe you're my Harry Maguire. Anyway, the, le- the, less said, the less said about that, <laughs> the better. Hello, anyway. Uh, hello. It's good morning. Good to be with you. Um, so lots been going on in FYEC. We've uh, we've had a really strong start to our local conferences, haven't we? They've been really good. Yeah, for four or five, I can't... I, I think it's five now. Five or six. Yeah, um, yeah. They just rattle away. We're showing them out a bit more this year, which is great news. But yeah, really good start and a really important topic. And actually, I, I, I've, I've just done one that I, I delivered. Um, and I I found preaching on Galatians chapter two really convicting, actually. Mm. It's really good time and time again to ask ourselves... What is our standing before the Lord? And I think in ministry, there's always this latent temptation to think our standing before the Lord is somehow in our ministry, in our results, in what we're able to do, in sometimes negatively what we're not able to do. So to be brought back to the fact that the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us Mm is just it, tremendously exciting for me. And I, I hope it's been helpful for people. Good, we've had good response, good attendance and good feedback. And there's plenty more to come. So if there's one near you, do book to, to join that. Speaking of bookings, the Leaders Conference bookings are open this week, John. Uh, yeah, the Leaders Conference coming up 4th to the 6th of November in uh, Blackpool. We're back again. I'm delighted that Brian Croft is joining us from Practical Shepherding. We're looking at Jesus, the Good Shepherd. We want to kind of um, love like Jesus, um, serve our people well in our churches. Um, so it's going to be a great time to get together to think about sort of ministering in our churches. It's absolutely not just for pastors, though, even though it's talking about shepherding. Mm -hmm. We see shepherding as a wider work that's done within the family of God. So this is for kind of pastors, elders, deacons, youth workers, children's leaders, kind of church administrators, uh, everybody involved in the leadership of the church. And we think one of the great benefits of the conference is where churches can come with their whole leadership team and they can interact with with, with one another. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, early bird discounts until I think it's about the 29th. 30th of June, June, 235 pounds. The tickets available on the FIC website. Just before I ask John about what he's been up to in other extracurricular activities this week, uh, Adrian, just tell us a bit about what we're going to be preaching from at the Leaders Conference because that's really exciting. Yes, we're looking at John's gospel. I mean, the theme is the Good Shepherd. So we have to really go to the passage on the Good Shepherd, Mm. Jesus saying, I am the Good Shepherd. And that's just helps us shape what else we're going to do. We're going to look at the I am sayings of Jesus, which is fairly well um, uh, kind of trod stuff, isn't it? But actually to come to it freshly and to say what kind of shepherd is Jesus, um, and just not just to reflect on the fact that he is a good shepherd, but mm. actually he is the resurrection and the life. He is the bread of life. He mm. is the light of the world. He is the one who, before Abraham was, I am. So actually, it's just, there's just a great depth to, to drink in mm. and enjoy and delight in. If, if we're going to be effective in the work of shepherding we've been called to, then our hearts need to be filled with Jesus. And that's what we're hoping for. 4th to the 6th of November, do book your tickets now. John, you've been at something called the Everything Conference yep. and you've been with Affinity as well. That's yep. it. Sounds like it's setting the bar quite low, the Everything <laughs> Conference. You could, it, really, it could really could cover a multitude of topics. Uh, yeah, I was at the Everything Conference, which was on Saturday, last Saturday down in London. Um, Everything is a group organised by David and Philip Stroud. David is the founding pastor of Christchurch, kind of London. Really, the vision is to support and encourage Christians Christians in a whole variety of areas of, of public life um, uh, and, and kind of serving in, in the community. Really, they've got a desire to want to recapture something of what the Clapham sect did in the kind of the 19th century of bringing Christianity to bear into civic institutions, a desire to bring about, um, in, in that sense, a, a cultural reformation of um, the kind of nation. Um, they can look back to the influence that the Clapham sect had on, for example, the slavery issue um, in the East India Company, um, uh, and just the massive impact impact that ultimately had um, uh, on the UK in shaping uh, its future and wanted to see something of that again. So um, basically, they support and encourage a whole variety of different kind of groups through the year who are sort of uh, serving in areas like government, education, um, kind of business, law, um, to help them uh, kind of serve Christ and seek the common good in those uh, kind of areas. And then the conferences that get together across Mm. um, the spectrum of those things. It was really encouraging to hear from people who are working in, say, the NHS, 
um, who are campaigning for issues like kind of age control on pornography, um, human trafficking, and to just be reminded that there are Christians in high places yeah. who are able to exercise and influence um, for Christ and bring about kind of change that that benefits uh, kind of people. Um, and, and at one level, that has to go hand in hand, I think, with the work of the gospel of reaching people with the good news of uh, kind of Jesus. So the Clapham sect and all that happened was off the back of revivals as well. And you kind of need both as kind of people come to know Christ and as then influence is exerted, mm -hmm. shaping the institutions um, of um, society. So I, th I, think, I think we can often have a very negative view of the situation of Christians in the UK, but there are lots of those working in a Daniel-like mm -hmm. capacity mm -hmm. on the inside of institutions and organisations. It's not an easy place to be. To stand for Christ in that sort of context um, is uh, kind of challenging. And I think it's important that we in our churches support people mm. out there. It's so easy for us as church leaders to forget that actually very often it's the, the, the congregation members who are on the front line, yeah. both in terms of evangelism and in terms of gospel impact in the wider society. And um, actually everything is seeking to su support people uh, at a relatively high level. In all of our churches, we need to be supporting all of our people as they go out and serve in that way. So that was encouraging. And then I was at Affinity, um, which is uh, a kind of a, a network of um, kind of conservative evangelical churches and organisations um, to want to stand together for the gospel, to want to encourage one another, build unity. We spent 24 hours as a conference um, in uh, kind of Glasgow. And again, what I really value about it is that opportunity to engage with um, other networks, mm. other, other mm. leaders, um, uh, particularly from all sort of four uh, countries of the UK. Um, it really is a genuinely kind of across Britain um, kind of gathering. Um, I, I think there are sort of um, uh, denominations that are uh, kind of Baptist, denominations that are independent, denominations that are Presbyterian. And it, it really is a, a meeting place for leaders there to share what's going on. Um, it was hugely encouraging, actually, to hear people reporting on what's going on in their different networks. Um, and again, um, a sort of a consistent picture of encouragement, churches growing, um, uh, a kind of new church planting initiatives. So quite a number of networks are seeing new churches being planted. I think that's a, a real uh, kind of encouragement. There are obviously particular challenges in Northern Ireland where um, kind of secularism is beginning to be more dominant than it has been. So, so, so Northern Ireland is changing rapidly and there are sort of significant challenges there. Um, but yeah, it was a good time of being able to get together. And we were thinking about how can we best serve kind of the cause of the mm. unity um, of the gospel um, in the nation. Um, currently, Affinity represents about 1,200 churches and, and a variety of uh, kind of um, uh, organisations and other Christian ministries. We're very grateful for Graham Nichols, who has been leading Affinity for a number of years and has uh, sort of gained a bit of a public profile speaking into the media on behalf of churches. And we just want to see that work grow. We're a member organisation. Yeah, yes, we are with Affinity saying. as well. So if you're an FIC church, you're also an Affinity yeah. church. You can belong separately and, and yeah. some churches do, yeah. but we're a member organisation. Yeah. Um, some sad news this week um, from the Christian world or this last couple of weeks. The death of Colin Hart, hmm. who's director of the Christian Institute, uh, very sudden yeah. and unexpected. He's been leading that work for a long paid. time yeah. and yeah. Uh, many people will know his uh, name, may well recognise his face uh, or voice. And um, if you're um, a church that kind of uh, accesses the materials, many do, mm. um, some of the, the very strong material that the Christian Institute produce, you'll know about Colin Hart. If you get their material, you recognise his name. So yes, he died very suddenly um, just one one evening a couple of weeks ago, and um, we need to acknowledge just the great service he's he's done the the UK Church, mm. um, and the way he's led that organisation, and actually be praying for the trustees as as they think about what next yeah. for for Christian Institute and and obviously thinking about replacing him, but actually in the immediate short term thinking about um, those who work with him and his family mm. and those who are grieving over his loss. Um, it's it's bittersweet, isn't it? Um, I, I think uh, the world does use this word bittersweet, but actually I think it's only Christians who truly understand the word bittersweet when it comes to death, um, that actually we understand the great glory of the resurrection and the hope to come. And yet there is a, a desperate grief in loss mm. and um, just the ugliness of death and the suddenness of death sometimes. So yes, let's let's pray on for the Christian Institute and, and all those who knew and loved 
Colin. I remember when Mike Ovi died at uh, Principal of Oak Hill College. I remember saying, um, oh, that's devastating. And one of my colleagues shot back, not for him. And that's exactly right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And um, we hold those two things together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think we'd be hugely grateful and thankful for the work of the Christian Institute. And Colin has really poured himself mm. into it. So mm. Um, mm. he started it. Um, he left teaching when he was in his 20s. It began in his back room. And it's been built into a very significant kind of organisation that speaks for Christians, that brings issues to the attention of Christians, yeah. that acts on behalf half of uh, kind of Christians. And I guess over the decades that CI has been in place, they, they've witnessed the rapid advance of secularization within within the mm. kind of the, the country. And many of the issues that are being faced today are much more about the liberty and freedom of Christians. And they have been very active in seeking to defend those freedoms. Mm. So they've been at the forefront at the moment of campaigns on conversion therapy, getting legal advice, threatening legal action if legislation is introduced that breaches kind of the, the Human Rights Act, mm. obviously assisted suicide is a huge issue. They were very significant in bringing together the Coalition for Marriage um, when proposals were being introduced there. So um, many have benefited from the research that they've done, from the information that they've produced, for that, from that campaigning on our behalf um, with government in a way that has sought to protect kind of the gospel freedoms that we um, uh, sort of enjoy. So we're very grateful for that. We pray on for his family and those who worked with him and knew him well. And um, we've talked about affinity. We've talked about our leaders conference. We've talked about the everything conference. We've talked about the Christian Institute. All of these are um, important for leaders in various contexts. And there's been lots of new stories um, uh, about leadership that have that have come out this last couple of weeks. So with that, in any, not in any particular order, we, we've seen um, Vladimir Putin re-elected with a huge landslide uh, in Russia as as their president. Um, what a surprise. Yeah, well, quite. Um, <laughs> Leo Varadkar has resigned as the Irish Prime Minister mm. in, in this last few days. Um, we, we've had some stories in the news about boring leaders referring to um, <laughs> uh, particularly the leader of the Labour Party and the, uh, the shadow chancellor. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in all of these stories, there are lessons for leadership, bad examples, good examples, faithful examples, less faithful examples. Yes. What can we learn from them? Well, I, I think I want to say, and this is perhaps well, just to do another plug for the Leaders Conference, that actually are our prime example for leadership in the local church. What does it mean to be shepherding in the local church? Is to look to the good shepherd. Mm. So all, all, of the, all of what we're about to say is said in the context of that. Um, but we are made in the image of God, men, male and female, and therefore we shouldn't be surprised that as we see leadership exercised in the world, there are lessons to learn both positively and negatively as we look at leaders. And and I think, um, I don't want to say too much about Putin, I hope no one's looking to Putin as an example of, of leadership, yeah. and I think people are particularly unsurprised by the election result. But I think the Leo Varadkar thing is interesting. Um, I, I'm Probably most people, myself included, don't know very much about politics in Ireland, um, we probably couldn't tell you what the split of parties, for example, are in the Irish Parliament. It, it does seem to be quite fragile at the moment. Um, uh, Ireland is rapidly secularising. Just we were talking about Northern Ireland, John, but but the Republic of Ireland, that the country of Ireland, is rapidly secularising as well. Um, and there was a, a referendum or two um, two referenda um, that took place uh, just a few Excellent weeks ago. Excellent grammar. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it was one referendum with two questions, so I don't know. Whether, maybe maybe whether you were wrong, wrong there. Um, which was, was, was pushed by Leo Varadkar, which was to change a constitution, to change the definition of family and um, some of those sorts of things. And um, the government lost both of those very heavily. Hmm. Um, and I, I think probably that was the sort of the death knell for Leo Varadkar. And he said, I'm not the man anymore to, to lead the party forward. And there's probably other things going on as well. I mean, it's very interesting that actually um, he's tried to accelerate the secularization and just didn't didn't really communicate that very well. I think it probably ended up being at some level a, a, a vote on the, the government itself. And so there's all kinds of questions tied up with, you know, when do you push for a vote, mm. things like that. Um, in, interestingly, it, it is a poison chalice. I think at the moment, the deputy leader of Fine Gael, the, the, the party from which Leo Radka comes, um, doesn't want to stand for election as the leader, um, obviously recognising that there's, it's not much of a, a, of a joy at the moment, um, the way the, sort of the, the parties are held together in the coalition. So I, I think just it, it's a reminder, actually, that, that leadership can be quite fragile. Mm. Um, I, I think all, all of us who are leaders in church serve on the basis of trust, essentially. Um, I, I mean, churches appoint leaders in different ways. The majority of our churches, I would think, probably vote for leaders, but not every FIC church does that. Some leaders are appointed. But nevertheless, whether whether leaders are appointed or whether they are elected, they serve on the basis of trust. Mm. 
but people trust them. They trust them in terms of their godliness. They trust them in terms of their gifting. They trust them in terms of in terms of their leading, and that may manifest itself in different ways depending on how congregational the church is. But trust is at the heart of that. And clearly, what's happened with the case of Leo Varadkar is he's, he's lost people's trust. He's mm. probably lost his party's trust. He's certainly lost the country's trust. And actually, it's, it's a good reminder that you can have all kinds of structures and all kinds of processes in place. But actually, if you lose trust, whether amongst leaders or between the leaders and the church, really, that's that's the end of that yeah. the leadership yeah. there. So, so I, I think as leaders, I, the big lesson for me here is we need to be thinking about how we build trust, not in an artificial way, and, but we need to be thinking about the things in leadership that will help build trust between ourselves and our churches. For example, I think transparency, mm. good, good godly transparency. And not that we tell everyone everything, because obviously there are some things that are confidential, but you, I, don't, I don't think leadership should operate in a kind of secret cabal. That doesn't build trust. So I, I think leaders should be thinking all the time, what builds trust in, in a way that's appropriate for our context? That looks different in a church of 500 than it does in a church of 25. But actually, but actually, trust is really at the heart of, of that. And um, it, it seems to me that's a very godly characteristic anyway. Mm. John? Yeah, I mean, I think reflecting on it with both um, kind of Putin and, and Varadkar, um, there are lessons about kind of uh, clinging on in leadership and <laughs> what happens there. So at one level, Putin can't let go of leadership. Mm. So he uses all the oppressive organs of the state to keep himself in his position because of his own personal vulnerability if he were not in that position. Mm. So it's no surprise that he's elected. Varadkar has stepped away voluntarily at that particular moment. Actually, he'd always said that he didn't want to go on leading beyond the age of 50. So he'd kind of sort of indicated he didn't want to be in office sort of perpetually. Um, but he obviously realised that it was the right time for him to step back um, uh, at one level, step back rather than perhaps face what would be defeat and on ongoing problems um, if, he, if he continued in his in his role. And I, and I think there are, those are two models of how to, how to approach leadership. There are some leaders who cling on no matter what because their identity, their security, their position mm. is bound up with being in leadership and they will do whatever is needed to try to keep that kind of position. Whereas um, Varedka realised that he no longer longer had the trust and confidence. And so he, he kind of, as it were, willingly stepped away. Um, and actually, th those are lessons for church leaders, I think, that on the one hand, you know, there are people who can cling on to power way beyond really having the support of the people. And in the end, that's ultimately counterproductive. Their reputation will suffer in, mm. the, very, in the long run. Um, when they finally um, do leave that leadership. Uh, uh, and then there's something noble and right about somebody recognising that their time mm. of leadership has yeah, come to an end to and it's better to Will leave. you tell Andy Murray that or <laughs> shall I add? Oh, poor Andy Murray. <laughs> I want to stand up for Andy Murray. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah. Um, Can I, I mean, just on, on that, I think the, the other sort of leadership thing that's, that's always in the news really is um, what's going to happen in the UK in terms of politics. Obviously, that there is there are, there are rumours that we might have a fourth Prime Minister in this in this Parliament, mm. I think that seems unlikely. Um, but interestingly, this week uh, Rachel Reeves, just at the beginning of the week, did a very long speech about sort of setting out her economic position um, and was kind of blasted in the paper really for being boring. Mm. Um, in the mould of Keir Starmer, who was um, interviewed very long interview on the Sun News Channel yesterday, I think, or the day before, and uh, was shown a word cloud of the way that people described him. And right at the heart, in massive letters, was boring. Are we not and, ready for boring leadership, though, well, after I, this re after I recent I want to make years? a stand for boring leadership. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it depends what we mean by boring. Um, I never want a sermon to be boring. I never want the gospel to be boring. But there is a place, isn't there, in Christian leadership, John, for, for, for leadership that is steady, mm. that is measured, that is careful. And I don't want to make a political comment on, on, on either of the parties, but actually... The, the kind of the kind of we we don't want in church Boris Johnsons frankly to be leaders do we um, we, we need people who are trust trustable mm -hmm. that word no it's not is it um, dependable um, that are Trust, solid trustworthy you know, those, that's yeah thank you, you want, thank you thank yeah. you those things are commendable qualities aren't they John oh, yeah I mean I think actually all of the people we've spoken about show there's a range of different leaders and kind of people who become leaders and actually um, often what do people want in leaders some people do want the big charismatic personality mm. um, they are turned off by the idea of the boring kind of um, uh, competence um, they want the strong man uh, to be uh, kind of in that position they want the sort of the inspiration they want to be told what they think they, they want somebody who tells them it's easy and that kind of things can just be be, tr be yeah. transformed. Yeah. So there, there is there is this mix of personalities and there's what people kind of um, um, want. I mean, it seems to me there are various components that make up kind of leadership. 
Um, uh, so there might be, uh, on the one hand, there are issues of competence, the ability to be able to do your job. Um, there are issues of character. Um, are you a person of uh, kind of integrity who's able to be kind of trusted? Then there's an issue of kind of almost a sense of personal charisma. Mm. Are other people kind of drawn to you to, to follow you? Are you able to inspire and in, infuse? And I guess in the best of leaders, you have all of those things coming together in some measure. But actually, most people are not kind of the best of leaders. Most people will be strong in some areas, but not in, in other areas. And I think if you look at what the Bible says, um, uh, it emphasises that, that, that in a sense, character is absolutely central. Yeah. That is the key thing yes. that is stressed in the New Testament for leadership of yeah. local churches, yeah. is that integrity. It does talk about competence. So um, for those who are, are kind of elders, pastors, they need to be able to teach. Manage the, their the, own the, like, household. Manage their own mm -hmm. household, which is basically about being able to run kind of the home, which in the ancient world was more like a small business. Mm. So you were financially competent, you were able to manage people, you were able to organise, you were able to get things done. So there is a competence level that is required for um, uh, kind of local churches. The element of personal charisma is nowhere near as strong, mm. actually. And I think one of the now, reasons... That, sorry, John, I just want to push you back a little bit on that. It is nowhere near as strong, but what, what about, you think about Jesus and Isaiah 52, 53, mm. you know, well, I rather wonder if for the local church leader, that's exactly the point. We proclaim him who is the yes. charismatic leader. The danger is if we take his place. So that, that in a sense... Although that, is it, is it, I'm trying to say in his earthly ministry, yeah. it, it seems that he, he didn't have anything to attract us to him, okay. did he? Well, yes and no. He had a vision that was clearly attractive to mm. people who came to him. So physically and by the standards of the day in terms of physical appearance, wealth, power, clothing, attractive. Now, people are often attracted when they're attracted to people by those superficial yeah. externals. Mm, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus that's right, did not yeah. fit the yeah. pattern of kind of the externals that society yeah. often looks to as indications of success and charisma. But at one level, his message was kind of inspiring. People obviously were attracted to him because of the compassion and the love that he mm. showed to them. Mm. So I, I think there was an element of a kind of a charisma that he had, but it's not the same as a yeah. worldly yeah, So it's a different kind of thing. That's helpful. Um, yeah. But I, I do think in ministry, our task is to present Christ primarily yeah, and draw right. people to him. Exactly and actually right. at one level, provided we are inspiringly proclaiming Christ and his word, then that is where the attraction ought to come from. Yeah. I think there's a great danger if we kind of put ourselves in the position of Christ and think that we've got to be the charismatic, mm. attra attractive individual. Yeah. Amen. FIC calls for boring leaders. That'll be the headline, will it? I think we need to have hopefully inspiring yes. leaders yes. Absolutely. Just who are competent. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point, it's point, Friday morning. We, 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 we point to the ultimate leader, don't we? The Lord Jesus. Exactly, that's that's yes. exactly the point. Who is never boring. Absolutely. Um, let, before we move on from leadership there's a story that's come out of the scottish parliament this week it's in front of you here adrian it's quite interesting yeah, it's quite interesting yeah, isn't it? So, so you know, a story um, ba banning staff in the scottish parliament from wearing rainbow lanyards yes not msps bizarrely but staff yeah, yes st staff yeah. who work I mean, it does there. seem doesn't it um if sort of to a watching world that everything looks one way in terms of the way it's going and actually i think i think we've said a few times on this podcast that if we live in an increasingly secular environment we want there to be some consistency in that so there's a story we maybe we'll come to in a moment about what's happening at King's Cross. We will. Um, where actually you do need to see some consistency, and there has been some consistency. But this is very interesting that the Scottish Parliament staff are no longer going to be allowed to wear rainbow, well, not just rainbow lanyards, but actually anything that promotes a particular social cause. Except for a poppy. So the poppy is the only recognised charity yep. by the Scottish Parliament. Yep. So poppies are going to be allowed. And um, yeah, if they ban poppies, they would have been thrown out of Parliament tomorrow. So yes, you can't do that. But um, actually, I, I think in some ways the rainbow lanyard has become a similar kind of token that mm. you, you can't, you know, I, lots of schools have them as, as you know, a lot of NHS have yeah. them, they're on the badges. So actually, can, can you do anything about this? And the Scottish Parliament, who of course are amongst all our um, national parliaments, probably the most liberal and progressive and aggressively secular have said, no, actually, to be consistent, we do need to ban this. So with the immediate effect, no more rainbow lanyards Which in is Scottish Parliament. Interesting, because the LGBT community, though, have said this doesn't please anybody. So they're not saying you should be allowed to wear rain rainbow lanyards necessarily, but they're basically <laughs> saying they've tried to do something, but it isn't actually going to please anybody ultimately. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the challenges of how do you navigate secularism, because they're, mm. in a sense, two different models there. One is to say ban everything, mm. because you've got to be a neutral space and therefore there's nothing. And the Scottish Parliament says this kind of conveys neutrality. Well, at one level, 
it appears to convey neutrality, but that doesn't mean the people themselves are actually neutral or their ideology is is, is a kind of a neutral ideology. Mm-hmm. It's just to some extent hidden. The other alternative is to say everybody can wear whatever they want that promotes the particular campaign or, or religious group. So, you know, Christians can wear crosses, others can yeah. wear yeah. a hijab, what, 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 whatever it is. So I think how you navigate secularism and a diversity of opinions, and there's a similar kind of thing going on with the kind of Garrick Club this week, which is an all-male club, and yeah. the kind of the yeah. membership has been exposed. And at one level, that's hidden. People don't walk around wearing I belong to the Garrett Club kind of labels, but yes. it's been said, well, that leads to Although I to think you could say that of, no women would. Well, well, would well indeed, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, that there, there is a sort of a hidden power that's an, a, an attitude. Yeah. And people have said, you know, head of the civil service, head of MI6, judges, etc., are all part of this kind of club mm. network. So, yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? You, you, you don't want people to be forced to wear something that they don't believe in. You've got to find a way of navigating the common space of mm. which people have a, a plurality of views. Um, how, do you, how do you do that in a way that helps everybody to be clear about their identity? And, and that, you probably don't do it with a d- display board at a train station. Well, no, and that brings us nicely <laughs> on to, because there's a number of stories going around this week about, about where kind of secular society and religion intersect. And this is exactly right. So at King's Cross Station for Ramadan, uh, there have been um, Islamic hadiths have been displayed on the on the boards at King's Cross Station. This has um, provoked a, bit, a range of pushback in various ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, one person uh, pointing out, you know, will they put Bible verses on um, during Holy Week? Um, for nonconformists, that starts on Sunday. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, but, 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 but the reality is that they, they probably wouldn't, and the, and the hadiths were, were taken down. But we're coming towards Easter. How how does a secular society navigate these different religions in a way that is fair and right to all? There's all sorts we could come on to. Um, hot cross buns at Iceland mm. having ticks on them instead, for example. I mean, what, what what's going on here and how should we respond to it? Because I just want, I don't know about you, I just want to celebrate Easter. Looking forward to celebrating Resurrection <laughs> Sunday. Looking forward to singing all the songs we sing over Easter, celebrating the resurrection of Christ. That's what I'm bothered about. I'm um, not really bothered about hot cross buns and things on yeah. station buildings. I mean, I think that's right. I think it, it, it is the challenge of how do we cope with our society and where we are. Um, and we've got a, a, a sort of a multicultural, multi-faith, plural society. Um, and I think for some, their offence on these things is because they think it's the undermining of some kind of British identity, which is bound up with being Christian. So people say, you know, this is terrible because we're a Christian country. And there is for some this sense that Christianity is disadvantaged and others are given kind of profile, but Christianity is is kind of constantly um, sort of diminished. Um, I think one of the realities we, we have to face is that you know, Christian country by history and tradition to some extent, yes, but by practice and belief today, clearly yeah, not. not. At all. Yeah. So, you know, the stuff about the kind of hot cross buns, I wonder how many people who go into Sainsbury's and buy a hot cross bun kind of look at it and think, oh, that reminds me of Easter and Jesus' death. I mean, mm. it's bizarre in itself. Probably think it's think St. That, George's flag. Well, they, they may well do. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> I there's a certain Christian symbolism here that to the vast majority mm. of people, probably has no meaning whatsoever, but is a, a tradition without any context. Um, you know, the statistics are that only about 6% of people go to church on a regular basis. Mm. You know, less than 50% identify as Christian believers in any kind. That That's exactly the reality in which we kind of find mm. ourselves. So uh, at one level, we get upset about the loss of kind of Christian tradition and Christian culture, but that's largely because Christian belief has collapsed. And this is the the outworking of that. Something else is going on in relation to, for example, kind of Islam and minority groups, which is the desire in society to kind of communicate that they have a place within British society today. So, you know, Lee Anderson defected from the Conservatives to the Reform Party and basically said, the reason he's doing this, I want my country back. But that begs a whole load of questions. Whose country is it? Who's welcome? Who Who is here? And so there is a deliberate desire to want to include minority groups mm. that are sort of small. The number of Muslims is only about 4% of the population. Mm. So uh, actually, uh, across a whole variety of institutions, people are wanting to communicate. We recognise that you're there and we value mm. you being there. Mm. You see that mm. in television adverts. Mm. You see that in kind of um, uh, the, the casts for sort of films, for uh, kind of TV programmes or whatever, the, the, there is a deliberate desire to want to accommodate mm. the minorities. Um, actually, the funny thing, of course, is people haven't woken up to the fact that true Christians are a minority in exactly the same way. Yeah. 
Um, so those of us who are true believers, who find ourselves a, a small minority in a predominantly unbelieving culture, we, we do feel ourselves treated unfairly because we're not treated like mm-hmm. other other minority we groups. Do, we do have freedom of speech yeah. still. So we have the freedom to play the um, the love theme from The Godfather, which, which you, might you may have heard, have heard in yeah, the that, background from the coffee the, van. The coffee man who comes <laughs> but interestingly, the so yeah. I think it isn't appropriate, is it, for Network Rail to be putting religious messages on on the display board. I, I did rather like the um the follow-up from that which was essentially that it was uh, stopping important train information yes. <laughs> but if you if you got off the train at king's cross and got on a tube at the moment you would see some um what are called 10 pounders which are the, the the place cards um adverts in in tube trains um you would see one for the bible app and it's very good and it's very it's very good it says zero stars satan yeah and um, i just think it's quite provocative it's yeah. helpful we have the freedom to do that kind of thing mm. So, so actually, um, institutions and and secular organisations and government organisations shouldn't be promoting religion, I don't think. Um, but Christians still have the ability to do so, and I think that's you know in the right context, done in the right way. That's great news. And we'll be celebrating Easter, of course, next weekend. Just a quick one for leaders: Is this a great evangelistic opportunity, or is this a time for the church family to come together and celebrate the resurrection? Together? I think that rather depends on your context. So, if if you're somewhere where lots of people go away. Um, you may find it it's limited. Um, so I, I think it it really is driven by knowing your context, knowing how people live, knowing um, how situations work. I, I mean, Easter is on people's radar, perhaps. Um, I mean, I'm a great believer that every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Mm-hmm. But I think um, we were just chatting about this yesterday, John, that um, that actually we do need to reclaim um, the resurrection as a as a major you know, a major part of the faith and Absolutely. Easter as a, as a major Christian festival has been rather taken over by other things, mm. but actually it is a great declaration, isn't it? Jesus it is. is alive. I mean, I think evangelistically, there's not the same opportunities there is at no. Christmas. Mm. It doesn't have the same cultural place. You don't have schools doing nativity plays. You don't have everybody knowing kind of carol singings. There, there isn't that sort of nostalgia for church that draws people in and gives them an opportunity to preach the gospel. My guess is the vast majority of churches on Easter Sunday will have far fewer visitors than they would have to yeah. a carol service yeah. or, or Christmas yeah. Day. So I think we need to recognise that. Um, I, I do think um, it is a vital moment for kind of reminding Christians of the very heart of their faith, that at the one level, it is all about the death of Jesus, dying for their sins to be forgiven, and his resurrection and his victorious triumph mm. um, and reign, that we serve a living Lord, and as a result, we have a living hope. And that is the absolute foundation of living the Christian life. Um, it's actually the foundation for evangelism, because our yeah. confident proclamation is Jesus is Uh, kind of Lord. So at one level, I don't think we should have to turn everything into an evangelistic kind of um, opportunity. There is a right and proper place for building up God's people, for reminding them of those truths so that they can live out in the world with confidence Mm. and so that they can share that good gospel news um, kind of with others. My guess is that most of the impact of Easter will be along those lines. But of course, because we're proclaiming the resurrection and proclaiming the truth that it happened and the implications that flow from it. That's inherently evangelistic. Absolutely. For those who are, are yes. there. Although you may be on your own because the clocks go forward. Oh, yes. <laughs> there we are. So make sure you change the clocks next weekend, not this weekend, if you're listening to this quite soon after it's published. Brothers, 31st of March. Thank, thank you yeah. so much uh, for joining me for In the News. It's been great to talk about some of the news. Jesus is alive. Day. Jesus is alive and we proclaim it, don't we? So this has been Independence, the FYEC podcast. Uh, do rate and leave a review so others can find it. And we'll talk to you again soon. Happy Easter. Happy thank Easter. You.